have your Bibles, we invite you to turn as we continue in our series in the book of Acts, chapter 23, and we want to read verses 11 through 35, Acts 23, 11 through 35. And the night following uh, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat or drink till they had killed Paul. And they were more than forty which had made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Now therefore ye with the council signify to the chief captain that he bring uh, him down unto you tomorrow, as though ye would inquire something more perfectly concerning him, and we <coughs> are uh, ever he come near or ready to kill him. And when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he hath a certain thing to tell him. So he brought him and brought he took him and brought him to the chief captain, and said, Paul the prisoner called me unto him and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee, who had something to say unto thee. Then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him aside privately and asked him, What is it that thou hast to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou wouldest bring down Paul tomorrow into the council, as though they would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. But do not thou yield it to them, for there lie in wait for him of them more than forty men, which have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat or drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready looking for the promise from thee. So the chief captain then let the young uh, men, man depart and charged him, See that thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things to me. And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesarea and horsemen, three score and ten, and spearmen two hundred at the third hour of the night, and provide them beasts that they might set Paul on and bring him safe to the Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter uh, after this man, Claudius Lysus unto the most excellent governor Felix said of greeting, as I was taken of the Jews and should have been killed, all of them then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. And when I would have known uh, the cause, therefore they accused him, I brought him forth into their council whom I perceive to be accused of questions of their law, but to have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or of bonds. And when it was told me how that the Jews laid wait for the, for the man, I sent straightway to thee and gave commandments to his accusers also to say before thee what thou had against him. Farewell. Then the soldiers, as, it command, as was commanded them, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipas, or Antiparis. On the morrow, they left the horsemen to go with them and return to the castle, who, when they came to Caesarea and delivered the epistles to the governor, presented Paul also before him. And when the governor had read the letter, he asked of what province he was, and when he understood, uh, that he was of Sicilia. And I will hear thee, said he, when thine accusers are also come, and he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. Tonight we want to continue in this series as we have seen Paul has been captured 
Uh, he was before the Sanhedrin when we left him last week and we saw his defense. This week we are going to see him transferred to Caesarea. Uh, I have been there to Caesarea and there's a beautiful old Roman Colosseum there in the ruins of it. It's right on the sea, the Mediterranean Sea coast of Israel, one of my favorite spots uh, of Israel. We see again, as we saw last week in verse uh, 10, that his life uh, is uh, threatened, the Jews uh, threatened him uh, because they, were they thought he was trying to subvert their religion. And once again, as he was uh, saved in uh, chapter 21 and chapter 22, he is saved by the Roman soldiers. It's not his time to go. He will go to Rome and do uh, some great witnessing, I believe, even before Caesar himself, before he is executed. But I believe what we're seeing here is uh, some of the final days of Paul as a free man. He will be a prisoner more so in the coming chapter than he will be free. But the Lord gave Paul some assurance the following night. He appeared to Paul. Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also uh, at Rome, or take courage. And uh, he's telling them that eventually he's going to Rome. So this was an encouraging vision. Paul had made plans to go to Rome, maybe not in this way, but eventually he's going to Rome. But it's going to be two years of the making before he gets there. Uh, a lot of times in the scripture, the Lord will set forth his will. And I'm thinking of uh, the boy King David uh, there the day when Samuel came to anoint him with all. Now, he didn't take over as the king of Israel right then. It would be several years later. So Paul will not immediately go uh, to Rome, it will take two years, and it will start with, first of all, his transfer uh, to Caesarea. And we see that it's precipitated by a plot. It was a foolish plot, as we saw there in verses 12 through 15. Forty Jews bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they killed Paul. And, of course, they would be unsuccessful in this because Paul will at least have two more years there to live before he goes to Rome. So uh, they've made a vow that they're not going to eat or drink until they have killed Paul. And they conspired with the chief priests and elders to have Paul brought before the council. But there was a conspiracy that they were going to tried to kill him uh, before he arrived to testify before uh, the council. So we see uh, in verses 16 through 22 that it was a failed plot. In fact, Paul's nephew, uh, his sister's son, uh, overheard uh, what uh, was going to happen. So. Uh, he went and he told Paul, and Paul had a centurion to take his nephew to the commander. Uh, so the commander informed of the plot, the commander sent Paul's nephew away. Now he's protected by the Romans because he is a Roman citizen. And that there uh, was an issue there back in chapter 22. So he uh, will be protected by uh, the Romans. Now we see the entourage there. 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spirit. And they left Jerusalem about 9 o'clock uh, that night. And with the 
70 horsemen, they escorted Paul beyond Anaparis. And they're escorting him there with uh, a Roman letter, as we saw there in verses 25 through 30 and 33 through 35. It was written by Claudius Elias, the Roman uh, commander, to Felix, uh, the Roman governor. Felix, uh, we see, uh, read it, and he arranged another hearing for Paul and his accusers. And until this hearing, Paul was detained in Herod's pro, uh, Praetorium uh, in uh, Acts uh, 23, uh, 35. Now we see some observations here regarding this section. We see the providence of God. Now God has a time, God has his timing for his servants. Uh, many conspiracies and many plots were wrought to try to kill Jesus before he would go to Calvary. I can't name them all tonight. But it was not the time. And it's not time for Paul to die here by the sake of the gospel. We're all protected, we as his children tonight, are protected by divine providence. There's nothing that happens to us uh, that is apart from the will of God. Now, I didn't particularly have a good week last week, and I've said one or two times, well, we've had bad luck. And uh, actually, that was an unspiritual thing for me to say. We even saw that I was taking home the doctor up there at Barrier Arts. We saw a black cat running across the road, and she says, we're going to have bad luck. Well, uh, sometimes I say that, but if you look at things and problems of God, everything happens for a reason. We don't understand it. And sometimes the Lord may allow Satan to throw things at us. I know that we have, a, I think, an awesome crusade that's coming up here in August. And I believe Satan is trying to fight it the best that he can. So uh, watch out. Some stuff may happen to y'all. I hope that it does. And don't quote me, but I hope that it does. But, uh, you know, when you get God's people to pray, that's a powerful thing. Uh, we, we find in Paul's life an example of God's prophets. Uh, God had in mind to save Saul of Tarsus. And the events on that Damascus road in chapter 9 were no accident at all. In fact, it would take... Paul being struck down by the Lord himself to change him. I don't think no amount of witnessing by man as, as uh, you know, good as that is could have ever converted uh, Paul. And by the way, we can't convert people. A lot of people say, well, I'm going out to save something. I can't save anybody and you can't save anybody. But we can tell them about one uh, who can. Now we have an example of uh, that we've had a series on Joseph there in the book of Genesis chapters 37 through 50. Now uh, God allowed him to uh, be captured there by uh, uh, taken by his brothers and thrown there into a pit and sold into slavery uh, in Egypt and wind up in prison and eventually he would wind up as the second in command uh, there in Egypt and he would save, he would be the salvation tool that God would use to save the known world at that time. So in both cases we see that God made a promise and in uh, verse 11 here of chapter 23 we see that God made the promise uh, that he would go to Rome, albeit in bond, albeit as a prisoner, and he would preach the gospel message. 
And the same promises were made, the similar promises to uh, Joseph in uh, Genesis 37. Both Paul and Joseph suffered quite a bit. Uh, but God had a plan in the suffering. In fact, it was foretold back in Acts 9 how Paul would suffer for the sake of the gospel. Um, you know, God, uh, he may answer our prayers, may not be now, but and it may not be in the way in which we expect. Uh, but like Paul and Joseph, we must place our trust in God that he will provide what we need. We can't see the path. Paul knew he was going to Rome. He probably wasn't sure exactly how it was his intention to go to Rome, but he's going to Rome uh, as a prisoner. We see man's fate here. Uh, now we can commend the Roman commander here until he wrote the letter to Felix. He had used his forces to protect Paul to protect Paul's life on several occasions. And he made several efforts to learn the truth about who Paul was, who Paul was. But in writing to Felix, the, the Roman commander lied. He claimed to have rescued Paul, knowing him to be a Roman uh, citizen. And that's not true. That's absolutely not true. He did not know before he had him flawed that he was a Roman citizen. And he didn't know Paul was a Roman until he almost scourged him back in uh, chapter 22, 24 through 29. Now, why did he lie? Well, he was trying to protect himself because had uh, uh, the higher officials, had Felix Adams known about this, more than likely they would have called him on the carpet and he would have gotten in a lot of trouble. Now, he twisted the truth trying to make himself look good, and that's a common weakness among men. We've all lied at one time or another, trying to twist the truth, trying to stay out of trouble uh, for a lie. I know uh, uh, I don't know, it seemed like I didn't get home in time, uh, and I lied to mom or something, and she wasn't too happy with it. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's what this Roman commander is trying to do. And we can compare that uh, to the psalmist. We can look back in uh, Psalms 15, uh, verse 2. Uh, we can see about uh, David. He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. And we see who swears to his own hurt and does not change there in Psalms 15, 4, and whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he that honoreth them that fear the Lord, he that sweareth to his own hurt and change not. And then we see uh, in Psalms 146 and Jeremiah 17, why we must trust in the Lord and not man. Uh, sometimes it's easy to manipulate a situation and try to, to give out trouble. So tonight, I propose with these questions, who and whom do we place our trust do we put it in man who tries to lies to protect himself? And believe you me, we're having a lot of lying in the government today. I mean, uh, if you <coughs> remember the Watergate era, and I was a little boy when it was happening, but I remember it. And that started the down spiral about trust in the government. But I tell you, what's going on today? 
I'll just say this and think Richard Nixon looked like a choir boy. There's widespread corruption, widespread lying. The only one that we can ultimately trust is in God who cannot lie. And trust in God, do we make allowances for his provincial workings? Do we understand that he does not always fulfill his promises in the way we expect? You know, we may be praying for something, something in our life, or some person, and it may not work out the way in which we want it to, but it will work out in which, according to God's will, God's timing and His plan. We must remember His ways and His thoughts are not our own. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not our, are your thoughts. And Paul's life, like that of Joseph, is a reminder that while God keeps His promises, He promises it may involve much time and many experiences before they are fully realized. Even though as uh, Isaiah said in 55, 6, and 7, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Next week we'll continue there and see Paul uh, before Thank you.